Take your Bible and turn with me to the table of contents at the front of your Bible. And if you would, go to where you see the listing of all of the various uh, books of the Bible that are there. And if you haven't already memorized this, go down there in the Old Testament, three quarters of the way down, and find the word Hosea. And after you find the word Hosea, look at that page number and then turn there to the book of Hosea, if you would. This morning we come again in our study to the story of Hosea, the prophet, the prophecy words of Hosea. And many of you have com commented already in the last two Sundays that the message of Hosea has already started its profound effect of causing you to look at your relationship with God in a new and different way, in a way that is far more sober, perhaps, than even before. This great book of the Bible, a small book of prophecy in the Old Testament, has a great and powerful message for us. So this morning we come again, our third message of Hosea, and we will be looking at the second chapter. But before we jump into the Scripture, I want to challenge you with a thought. We look at the message of Hosea, and if you sit down and read through it, in fact, last Monday morning, Marcy and I got up and we read through the entire book of Hosea together. We read it out loud. Um, 14 chapters, not very long, doesn't take very long to read it, but it is a profound book. It's the type of literature that we're not used to reading and in fact, there's some things, especially if you're new to the study of the Bible a little bit, there, there's some things that you're going to have to work through to see, to understand where exactly it's going and what exactly God is saying. Why would God include this book in the Bible? Why would this book be in the Old Testament? And why would many of the prophetic books be there? What is it that God is seeking to say to us? The message of Hosea, like the little message of Jude or the little message of Titus that we've studied over the last couple of years, the message of Hosea is an important message for Christians to hear in 2019. Sometimes messages are thick and difficult, and they take uh, a turn that we're not used to. I, I was thinking back through various stories that I've read, books that I've read, novels that I've read or various movies that I've seen that had a profound impact upon me. I don't know if you have some movies that you think about or some stories that you think about that when I read that in high school or when I read that in college or when I read that um, sometime uh, in my adulthood, that that story really taught me some things maybe from a scriptural point of view, or maybe it's the literature um, that, we see, that we have of the powerful stories of even this present time. If I were to reduce it down to movies at first, I, I think about the movie Schindler's List. Schindler's List was a difficult movie to watch. It was not an easy watch. It wasn't grab the popcorn and grab the, you know, the whatever the other things that you grab and sit down and enjoy the movie. The, the story of Schindler's List and the story of the Holocaust was a very, very difficult story. In fact, in this case, it was a loosely true story that was powerfully presented that taught me much about the evil of mankind's heart and about how God is showing us our need for a Savior. And we also see the fact that God uses people in this world to present His grace in rescue. Some of you were deeply affected in the 70s and 80s by Alex Haley's Roots. I remember being affected by that movie. I remember that it impacted me. It was one of the first times I really had a look at American slavery and slavery around the world in the picture of this, that, that it started to, to bring the history alive to me. I remember in St. Augustine that I got to know a man who was an 87-year-old doctor, and he had been a medic during the Normandy invasion. 
And he told me about the reality and the truth of saving Private Ryan. When I saw that movie and I, and I saw the, the great horror of the Second World War, and when I began to see all of the conflict and, and even heard this scandalous story of a whole platoon of men going after one man to bring him home because his brothers had been lost, and I, I just remember the impact of that film upon my life. I, I remember the impact of The Hiding Place. Many of you have seen the story of Corey Ten Boom. The others I won't necessarily recommend just because everybody has different standards on some of those things. If you do want to watch some of those, there's a thing called Vid Angel, and I highly recommend for you to look into Vid Angel. It cleans up movies before you watch them. But the story of The Hiding Place, the real story of the Corey Ten Boom family that came and it helped Jews escape from Hitler's Nazi Germany. And I remember as a child in this church watching this story that was a difficult story to watch, but yet an important story to watch as I would learn about um, the realities of evil, evil regimes and the hatred of mankind. And yet also, once again, the salvation of Christ is portrayed in, hiding, in the hiding place. Some of you have seen this film, an Italian film, Life is Beautiful. And I remember the story of this that was, it was a little bit, I mean, in some cases it's funny, but it was a little bit slow. But as it, as it started to reveal the difficulties and the hardships of the Holocaust, I remember I learned a great deal about this. Many of you know that Marcy and I served in North Africa. And there was a group of seven priests that were murdered by uh, terrorists in the mountains of Algeria. In the movie of Gods and Men tells their story. And I remember watching that and hearing the story of their faith and their decision to stand in that place amidst the 1990s, a civil war, and then Islamic terrorists came and they, they had the option to either stand for the sake of the gospel or to run. And they said, no, God has called us to remain a witness. And I remember the powerful story of their faith. Many of you read the story of A Tale of Two Cities when you were a child. Or you read Le Miserable, and you see the picture of sacrifice. And here we are with Le Miserable, 1,200 pages um, in this story. And it's, it may take a while to get through and it may be kind of thick, and there's, a, there's an involved storyline, but it's the kind of story that is worth your time. It is worth what you come to see. In fact, Bill Billingsley, outside the Bible, his favorite story written in modern literature was Le Miserable. And in part, because of him, I fell in love with Le Miserable. Some of you say, who was Bill Billingsley? Bill Billingsley was the pastor who preached in this church for three, over three decades. You see, stories can be long and involved, or stories can require quite a bit of, of ramp up in getting ready, and Hosea is one of those stories. Hosea is one of those stories that is worth our time if we will take the time to look and to see. And the message today comes in and helps us to see what is in chapter 2, extreme unfaithfulness, yet more extreme love. So extreme unfaithfulness, but even more than the extremity of that unfaithfulness, is even greater is the extreme love that we see in God. And page number one of your outline, I want to ask you to warm up your pen, and we're going to fly this, this morning. And I want you to see the review with me. If you're new to us, for Roger and Marilyn and others that are here for the first time, you need this review. And if you were here over the last two Sundays, this will help the message of Hosea make, make sense to you as you remember and learn, learn the story of this prophet. Number one, remember with me that Hosea was God's prophet to Israel. And that's the northern kingdom during the years that there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Northern kingdom is Israel. And he was the prophet of God's people for 25 years 
about 750 years before Christ. So during the 8th century B.C., he is a prophet that is there proclaiming God's message. Number two, we need to remember the setting. Israel was grossly filled in unfaithful. Israel was grossly unfaithful to their covenant with God. Circle the word covenant. God is a God of covenants. He's a God of commitment to his people. And he calls us to be a people of commitment to him and to one another. Throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament, you see the importance of covenant, of covenant people. And here we see that the God's people were unfaithful to him and they worship the Baal gods. The Baal gods. I'd like for you to say Baal together. Usually we grew up saying what? We say Baal. Um, And you can say Baal, but Baal is a more appropriate way, as you would say toward the original language that would be here, the Baal gods. And it wasn't just one god. It was the many gods of Baal. So instead of worshiping the one true God, the one who had delivered them out of Egypt, the one who had delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh, the one who had brought them into the promised land, the one who had provided for them, fed them in the wilderness, the one who time and time and time again, they saw the miraculous hand of God, God's people still would go away and run after other gods. Look at number three. Hosea the prophet, his marriage and his children were an object lesson. They were an object lesson to the people of his day. You say, wow, that's kind of a a rich one here. That's amazing that God would require that his own marriage and his children would do that. Yes, but God in his grace was accomplishing something great. And he he was sending an important message. And he worked through this. Notice number four, God in his mercy powerfully spoke through Hosea's family and his preaching. So both the model of his family and the message that he was preaching. Number five, Hosea's wife Gomer would be promiscuous and unfaithful to him. Number six, Hosea's children would be symbolically named after Israel's evil in judgment. You remember with me last week, we studied about not only Hosea's marriage, but also his children. And so the base message, number seven, of Hosea, the base message is, you have been unfaithful to God, but he will be faithful to you. If you would, just put a big circle around that quote. You will be unfaithful to God, but he will be faithful to you. That is the big picture of what we see when we look at Hosea, and that's the message that's right on the surface. Notice here with me the two boxes that are Gomer in Israel are the idea. Gomer is his wife, and and Hosea and God are on the other side. Gomer and Israel are unfaithful, but Hosea and God are what? Faithful. Gomer and Israel are running away But Hosea and God are running after. Gomer and Israel are letting go, but Hosea and God are holding fast. And so Hosea's own life is the picture of what God is doing. It's very important for you. If you're new to this study, you just understand that Hosea's life and his wife and his children are what God is saying is the bigger picture for himself and his people. Notice number eight. The ultimate truth, Hosea's ultimate truth, and we saw this last week a little bit, and we see it again this week, is that salvation is only by God's loving, merciful grace. There is no way that salvation comes other than God's loving, merciful, undeserved, unmerited favor. There is nothing in his people that is is deserving of his forgiveness and his grace. And Hosea, the message of Hosea, and as we look at the behavior of Israel's life, we see that the only hope that they would have is that God would be merciful and gracious to them. And it's the same thing 
for us in this day and time as well. That salvation is only by God's loving and merciful grace. And this powerful story just absolutely trumpets that great truth, that ultimate truth. Remember with me chapter one, scandalous story. We called it God's scandalous love in us. And what was the scandalous love? In verses two through three, Hosea is commanded to marry a promiscuous woman. He marries, what's her name? Gomer. There's key words here. These, these names are important. I want you to see that this is, this is how we run in the storyline that is here. Verses four through five, Gomer bears a, Hosea a son, and it's Hosea's son. God says, name him Jezreel, and he's naming him Jezreel after an evil incident where an evil Israelite king murders a godly man. And here it is as if God is saying, every time you see this prophet's son named Jezreel, I want you to remember what you did. I want you to remember what your people did, what Ahab did, what Jezebel did when they murdered Naboth of Jezreel. I want you to remember what happened in the Jezreel Valley. I want you to see that you have sinned against me, that you have turned away from my covenant, that you have gone out after wicked kings, you've gone out after other gods. You need to see that you're wanting before God. You see, God in his mercy begins to show us that we're not adding up. God in his goodness, it's not a bad thing when God starts to reveal your sin, when you feel conviction of your sin. That is not a bad thing. That actually is a good thing that God is showing you that you're off, out, that you're off um, target, that you're out of bounds, that you're outside of his will and his holiness and his grace, and that that is how we come to see that we must turn back to him. And so we see that with little Jezreel's life, Hosea's son. Look at verse six and seven. Gomer bears an illegitimate daughter. So Gomer goes out, she's a promiscuous woman, she's not faithful to her husband Hosea, the prophet of God, and she, she bears an illegitimate daughter. You say, what do you mean by illegitimate? The picture is this. It is not within the confines of marriage. It's not within this picture that this child, as God has designed, for there to be a sexual purity and a purity of God's design of bringing together. And so this happens. Now, now we see here that God says, name her no mercy. And it's the picture of this that just like Gomer goes out after other men being unfaithful to her husband, the nation of Israel keeps going out after other gods, keeps going and praying to other, other sources of strength. Listen to this. Keeps going to other kingdoms, seeking to have security from Assyria or seeking to have help from Persia. And we, seek, and we see that there is this not trusting in God but simply saying that there are other places that we can go besides the one who delivered us from Egypt. Look at verses 8 through 9. Gomer bears an illegitimate son, and God says, name him, not my people. You should have him there, not her. Name him, not my people. And so here we see again that God is saying, you are out of bounds. You have acted evil. You have gone out away from the covenant that we have. And you need to recognize that you are running from my relationship to you. And if you run from my relationship with you, you will have no mercy and you will not be my people. Just like the pagan the pagan entities and the pagan kingdoms that are all around them. But something very strange happens at the end of chapter one. We saw this at the end last Sunday. God shockingly renews his covenant with Israel. God shockingly at the end, after saying, you're not going to have my mercy, you are not my people, God comes back, and for no explicable reason other than his commitment to his people, does he say, you are my people and I am your God. You will receive my mercy. And, the, and we, we look at Hosea's message and we go, there's nothing in them that deserves his mercy and his grace, but this indeed 
is the grand picture that God's ultimate truth is this, that salvation only comes by God's loving, merciful grace. Well, key observations from chapter 2 as we get into this. Chapter 1 sets the precedent for the whole book, and chapter 2 dives in, and you can fill this in, it kind of dives into the nitty-gritty. Now, I feel sorry for you if English is a second language, maybe like Marcy or some of the others that are here, you go, what's the nitty-gritty? Um, occasionally somebody will say that. Pastor, sometimes you use, you know, English euphemisms and so forth. What's the nitty-gritty? It means the small dirt. It means the small details, all the details that are really the difficult part that is here. Notice this, that chapter 2 dives into this, but it's worth our look. In verses 1 through 3, 1 through 13, we see that God prosecutes his case against Israel. God is saying to them what they have done wrong. And we need to see that because not only do we look at what Gomer did wrong and Israel did wrong, but we can start to see how we go out after other gods like they do. Look, notice the next bullet point there. We see the power of Hebrew poetry intensifies this message. Um, if you have your Bible open, you notice that not all of it has the same margins and the other things like that if you have an ESV or some of the other um, copies of Scripture that retain the poetic form. And the reason is, is that this is poetry when you come to chapter 2. And the reason of the poetry is that it makes the message that much more powerful. Notice the third bullet point here. The analogy between Gomer and Hosea and Israel and God weaves back and forth and back and forth through these verses. And so if you want to see and understand the real message of this book, you have to recognize that in one moment it's talking about Gomer and Hosea's marriage and her unfaithfulness to him, but that is a reflection, and then we see references to where Israel was unfaithful to God. And so, Homer's, or Hosea's real-life example of his own marriage is this living model of the message of where the nation of Israel has been unfaithful to God. Notice that whenever you see Gomer's lovers spoken of, it is referring to the Baal or the Baal gods. And we see it in verse 2, we see it in verse 5, 7, 10, 12, 13. Over and over and over again, we see the story of how Gomer is going out after other men. And go, each time you see this picture of Gomer going after other men, we start to see that this is the nation of, of Israel going out after either Baal gods, or in some cases, we also see that they're going after and depending upon other nations instead of God, like the Assyrians or like the Persians. Notice the last thing that is here on this page. God reestablishes his covenant with Israel. Unbelievably, inexplicably, again, at the end of chapter 2, verses 14 through 23, we see that God says, you are my people. I'm going to love you. And we see that he has a plan that they would come to know him and to be his people. Top of page chapter two, or page two, says that God will patiently and powerfully restore his people to himself. If you're new to the preaching of Christian gospel and Christian truth, you need to understand that this is the great hope of the Christian life. And it's not a wishful hope, but it's the sure hope. It is the promise that God has made that he patiently and he powerfully restores his people to himself, and he does it through his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see the, the beautiful picture leading up to Christ in the life of Hosea. Notice what it says here. The life of Hosea and his family constantly model God's message to Israel and to us, you can add, and to us all the way through his prophecy. So all 14 chapters, this is the picture. And the people's wicked rejection of God is met with his unrelenting love and forgiveness. He no doubt 
shows them that they're wrong. He no doubt warns them, as we'll see, but it's his showing them and his warning them, and it's this message that you're off base that is actually coming from his love in order to turn us back to what is right. You know, there's a lot of people that start to read certain passages of either Old Testament or New Testament, and they like to cherry pick the verses that seem encouraging. In fact, there's a lot of churches in this day and time that they want to give you four messages on how to be a winner. Um, they want to give you very positive self-health messages with, um, uh, you know, the uh, positive message of the gospel mixed in there, and it makes you feel good when you leave, like you can go and, and you can live a nice, joyful, happy life this week. My friends, there is no real encouragement aside from being right with God. Any encouragement that you have will be very short-lived if it's based upon either emotions or if it's based on optimistic thinking. Because eventually the storm clouds come, eventually the sickness comes, eventually the sails go down, eventually there, is th there are things that come along that seek to drain away this temporal joy. But when we come to the true message of the gospel, we see that being right with God on His terms is worth the time and the effort. And so as we come and as we look at this, it's good that we see how seriously God takes his covenant with us and that we would come and learn of his serious nature in that and that we would begin to learn how to respond to him by the power of his grace. So in verses one through two of chapter two, we see God beginning to work in this. Now what I've done is I've included all of the verses of chapter two here so that you might be able to follow along very easily and very carefully. If you do not have an ESV version of the Bible, I would encourage you to buy one because of as the, the way we preach and the way that we move forward verse by verse in the life of this church, it makes it so much easier for you to pay attention. They're available in the bookstore. I want to encourage you to do that. But this morning, I've included, that's why there's actually four pages. I want you to have the same version that I'm reading. It'll make it so much easier for you. So look at verses one and two. First of all, we see that God, fill it in, calls his people to repent of their unfaithfulness. That's what we see in verses 1 and 2. Look what it says. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Look at the next part. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. She it, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Here is the very graphic picture that Gomer is presenting that she keeps going out after other men. Here she is, the Ho Hosea's wife, and she's going out after other men. And this is the exact picture that God's people keep going out. That is how disgusting our worship of other gods is. How gross and vile it is that we would choose to find our solace in something besides the one who made our souls. And so here God is saying, repent of your looking elsewhere. Repent of your unfaithfulness. Verses 3 through 5, God threatens to expose and condemn his unfaithful people. And here we see the picture of Hosea and, and Gomer. Hosea is writing, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, that's naked, exposed, and make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and kill her with thirst. You see, in this day and time, when there was someone who violated a marriage covenant, whether it be a male or whether it be a female, they could be cut off from the people. They would be simply exposed in this. And we know that both a man or a woman could be stoned for their unfaithfulness in this. Notice here with me that this is a grave and gross sin. In verse 4, upon her children also I will have no mercy. We already saw that in ch chapter 1. Because they are children of whoredom. She'd gone out and gotten pregnant from other men. For their mother has played the whore. 
who she, she who conceived them has acted shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers. Here she is. She's very blatant about it. I will go after my lovers who give me bread and my water with my wool and my flax. So they clothe me. They give me things to eat, my oil and my drink. So here she's, she's very blatantly saying, Hosea, I'm going to go after the others. They are providing these things for me, and I'm going to run, and I don't care what you think or what you say. And God is saying, Israel, you do the same thing. And God is saying, I'm going to expose this to you. I'm going to show what you're doing. I'm going to show the the gross nature of your rejection of the covenant that you have with a faithful God. And so God threatens to accept. Look what it says, lest I strip her naked. So here we see that God is saying that he could condemn unto being cut off from him. In Isaiah chapter 5, it also says that your sins have cut you off from God. Look at verse 6 through 13. We see another picture that is here. God in his love, circle those words, in his love on your outline. Verses 6 through 13, God in his love pursues his unfaithful people. Now, this is where it gets crazy. You see, the first parts make sense. Verses 1 and 2 and 3 through 5, this makes sense. It makes sense that if there's someone being unfaithful, that someone is going to say, hey, stop your unfaithfulness. And if they don't stop their, uh, your unfaithfulness, it makes sense, verses 3 through 5, to say, if you don't stop this, we're going to expose you. I'm going to expose you. I'm going to cut you off. You can't continue. In fact, who in this day and time would have this go on and on and on? We, we, we kind of think about that. We say, well, normally you wouldn't just put up with that. You wouldn't let your husband or your wife continue going on and on and on, going after other lovers. You would bring a stop to it. In fact, there's even a scriptural picture that it is possible to be divorced in, the, in light of this very reason for adultery. But here we see, and you see, we, we know a lot about all of that because we have a lot of marriage problems in our world today, and we have a lot of divorce issues in our world today. We, some of you have had to think through all of this. Some of you have had to walk through all of this. Some of you had, would say, yeah, I walked through this, and I was the offending party. And others of you would say, well, I wasn't the offending party, but I was offended in this, and I know what this looks like. I know what this feels like. And the first two make sense. One would be saying, stop. And the other one would be saying, if you don't, this is what's going to happen. But what doesn't make sense is where it starts in verses 6 through 13. When God would be justified to walk away from Israel, when Hosea would be justified to walk away from Gomer, and instead, because of what, does he pursue her? Because of what? It's right there next to 6 through 13. In love. In love, he pursues her. Look what it says here next to the first bullet point. In love, he blocks her paths. So in verse 6, we see, and you see, notice the therefore. In verse 6, it says, therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. You see that? He's saying, I, I'm going I'm to I'm go try to alter what she's doing. He'd be justified to walk away. But instead, he says, I'm, I'm going to bring some thorns on this side so she's not going to go this way. And I'm going to hedge up a wall on this side. So she said, I'm going to seek to direct her back to what is right. Look at the next bullet point. In love, he thwarts her efforts to be satisfied in her sin. So she's seeking satisfaction in other lovers, and he's saying, I'm going to try to make it so she's not satisfied in others. Look at verse 7. She shall, she shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me than now. Here's what God is saying to Israel. 
I'm going to make it so they're not satisfied in the other gods. They're not satisfied in the other nations. I'm going to make it where they're going out after this, and it's going to be like ashes in their mouth. It's going to go out. It's not going to be satisfying. They're going to come away going, man, we need to get back to God. You know, sometimes God does that with us. We start going after other stuff. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's materialism. Maybe it's, maybe it's status of some sort. You start going after something, and, and you, you start, you're really neglecting your relationship with the Lord, and you're running after other things. You're starting to worship something else. And God, in his mercy, makes it miserable. You see, that's one of the indications that you're loved by him. Now, if you can run away from him and go run and find great satisfaction and not look back, it's pretty evident that you're not his child. But if you go running after something else and it gets more miserable and more miserable and more miserable to the fine, finally you stop and you start to turn around, he's saying, you left your first love. Come back to your first love. You see, and this is what God is doing. He's swarting her efforts to be satisfied with other lovers. And some of you know exactly how that feels. Maybe not in a sexual marital way, but maybe it's in pursuit of other things. Look at the last one there on page two. In love, he provides, this is stunning. This is absolutely stunning. In love, he provides for her even when she's running away. I mean, notice what it says here in verse 8. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Don't turn your page over yet. I want you to see this. God is the one providing these things, knowing that they are going to be misused for other things. Now, God, God is saying, I'm going to come and still take care of her. I'm going to come and make sure that she has enough to eat. I'm going to come and make sure that she's clothed. I'm going to come and still care for her, even though I know she doesn't love me. What kind of a husband does that? Think about Hosea for a moment. He gets together some grain. He gets together um, some wine. He gets together the the oil, and the the idea of that is you cooking oil or oil for your body. And he and he brings and he leaves outside where Gomer is staying with another man. Supplies for her, so she wouldn't be hungry. She doesn't know where it's coming from. You see, that sometimes we don't realize the provision in the hand of God providing for us while we're running in our sin. God doesn't just cut us off. He's giving us perhaps time to turn back to him, and he's showing us that we need him, and he's he's patiently, that's the key word at the top of page two, God is patiently, and powerfully bringing us back to himself. I mean, there's a grace there and a love there that maybe you would say, I don't have that. But your God does. Look at the top of page three. But then we see that in love, and we see another transition here in verse nine, therefore, in love he cuts off her supplies. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax. That's the the things that would be clothing her, Uh, the idea of new clothes, that kind of thing, which were to cover her nakedness. And so he's saying, okay, so now in turning her back to me, I'm going to apply some pressure here. I'm going to take back those things. I'm not going to let those things continue. In the nation of Israel, God does that as he comes and brings another nation to 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 prune them he brings another nation to punish them to take away from them so that they would look to him and while they were perhaps thinking 
What has God done? He's now neglecting his people. Look, here come the Assyrians, or here come the Babylonians. Why is he allowing this to happen? And you can see that God's hand is saying, oh, I'm bringing them to teach you. I'm bringing them to teach you that you have gone astray. I'm bringing them to show you that you need me, a good king and a good God. Notice the next one here. In verses 10 through 11, we see that in love, he kills her partying. He just takes away the enjoyment of her worship and her involvement in other things. Look at verse 10. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all of her mirth or her happiness her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And so the picture is this, that Israel has been, is going out after all of these other gods. She, she doesn't realize what all she's doing, and God is saying, I'm going to strip all this stuff away. And so they start to realize that they are being unfaithful to me, and as they are being unfaithful to me, their happiness is going to be taken away so that they can see that the things that they've been pursuing are not the eternal truths of a loving God. So he, and he takes this away. You know, I put out there to the side the prodigal son. Is this not in part what you see as Jesus tells the story of the wealthy man who had two sons? And one of the sons was faithful in the house, and the other son came to him and said, I want my inheritance now. And that son takes his inheritance and runs off to a foreign land, and he has all of this money, and he's blowing everything that he's been given by his father. And then when all the money is gone, and all the friends that came with that money are gone with it, he finds himself eating the slop of pigs that he's feeding. And he says, my life is a wreck. But my, serv- my father's servants eat better than I do. They live better than I do. Maybe I'll go back to my father. Maybe I'll go back to him. Maybe he'll have mercy on me. You see, God in his mercy kills the partying. For those who love God, when they get off off course and suddenly all this fun stuff doesn't seem so fun anymore and you're starting to see how empty it is or it's all gone, the resources from it are gone, God is saying to you, it's not that I don't love you. I'm saying to you that I love you by taking this away so that you'll come back to me. Do you see why Hosea is rich? Do you see this? I hope you're getting this. Bear, bear with it. Let it, let it come, and, and let the truth of God's Word begin to, to show you its depth. This is worth your time. Look at the next one that is here. In love, he takes away her prosperity. In verse 12, we see, and I will lay waste to her vines. So, so Israel has all these vines, and Israel has these orchards, and Israel has all of this produce that is being brought. He says, he says I will lay waste to her vines, so they're not going to have grapes, they're not going to have fig trees anymore, and of which she said, these are my wages, which my lovers have given to me. Hmm. I will make them a forest. So he's, he's going to wipe out their vineyards and just make it a forest. And the beasts of the field will devour them. So God, look at this, in his love is taking away the prosperity. I don't know how many people I have met that have, that's been part of their testimony. That everything got wiped out in their business or the storm came and took everything or something came and took away their popularity or whatever it was, and they began to realize that this world only offers the temporal things, and God is saying, come, and come worship me, and see what is truly eternal. And so it's when the prosperity of this world is taken away that some people start to realize they need God. In love, he punishes her adultery and her idolatry. Um, This is the picture that in verse 13 we see God makes this statement. 
I will then, and this is the most harsh that, that we see in this. I will punish her for the feasts of the ba, of the Baals or the Baals when she has burned offer, burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and her jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Circle that part that says, I will punish her. Now, very, very often we think of punishment as merely punitive, but very often God is using a punishment in order to be healing, in order to turn us. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so, here we see God is chastening them for their worship of Baal. And we see the ultimate statements that as they forgot him, they come to realize they need to remember him, and God does it very often through punishment. Now, as we close, I want you to see page 3 and 4. Look at verse 14 through 23. This is the last part of the chapter, and look what it says. It goes from this stark reality of all the things that they were doing wrong and God's love in calling them back to himself. We see the Lord's great love and mercy restores Israel. Verse 14 and 15 is just amazing. Here we see the Lord's tender, tender loving kindness. The word loving kindness is so beautiful that moves his people to himself. Look at verse 14. Again, the word therefore. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. Here's the idea. I'm going to take her away from all of this. I'm going to bring her away from all the things she's depending upon, and I'm going to get her alone with me. I'm going to get her away from those other lovers. And for the case of Israel, I'm going to get her away from those pagan gods, and I'm going to pull her out here where, it's, where she doesn't have anything but me to protect her and to depend upon her so that she can see that she needs me. And I'm going to, look what it says at the end of verse 14, and I'm going to speak tenderly to her. Then imagine Hosea, Hosea going after a woman that repeatedly has left him, repeatedly embarrassed him, repeatedly violated his covenant with her, and he says, oh no, I'm going to go get her, and I'm going to take her on a honeymoon. A honeymoon. I'm going to bring her back to me. I'm going to show her my love, and that's what God is doing with our wayward hearts. He says, I'm going to show you that my love overcomes your foolish sin. And I'm going to show you that you have nothing that compares with me. Verse 15, and there I will give her her vineyards. In the, in the wilderness, I'm going to give her vineyards. I'm going to make the valley of Achor a door of hope. That's where Achan sinned, and that's where judgment was brought upon the nation of Israel because of Achan's sin, and God is going to make the place of Achan's sin a valley of hope. Wow. And there shall she shall answer as in the days of her youth, back when she used to love me, back when she was so in love with me. She's going to be that way again. As at the time when she first came out of the land of Egypt. You see the, the relationship. It's not just Gomer. I, I want you to see the weaving back and forth between the story of Gomer and Hosea and the story of Israel and God and how God delivers them out of Egypt. And they're in the wilderness and they're saying, praise God, he delivered us from Pharaoh. They get on the other side of, of the, the Red Sea, and they say, praise God, he's delivered us in this. Praise God for these different things. And so we see that there is a, a sweetness that they're going to return to. You see, Romans chapter 2, verse 4 is a very key verse for us. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It is the kindness of God, the goodness of God, that leads his children to see who he really is. Amen. Finally, I want you to see the last part here, that verses 16 through 20 show us 
that God will sovereignly and supernaturally bring the miracle, the miracle of repentance and restoration and fidelity, right below the word fidelity, faithfulness to his people. You see, this comes from God. God brings to our heart repentance. God brings to our heart restoration. And he brings to us a faithfulness that we don't have. In verse 16, look what it says. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. And no longer will you call me my Baal. Verse 17, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth and they shall be remembered by name no more. You see, names are a big deal. Names are saying a lot in Hosea's story. The name of Gomer, the names of his children. And here, we keep saying that they were, they were calling out after other gods, and God is saying, don't call out after other gods. Come and see my love, and when you experience my love, you're no longer going to call out to the Baals. You're going to call out to Jehovah God and remember who I am. And you're going to forget the other ones. Verse 18, and I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things on the ground. You see, this is miraculous. God can cause all of creation to come and bless you and take care of you. Look what he says. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and the war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. No longer are other kingdoms going to come attack you. Verse 19, and I will and I will betroth you to me forever. In his grace, he's going to engage us for marriage forever. And I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. Those are key words, righteousness and in justice. You see, all of this is coming to us through Christ. Christ is the fulfillment. What Christ is the faithful one that we could never be faithful. Israel would fail. Israel would fail. Israel would fail. But in Christ, there would be fulfillment of the covenant. And all of those who come through Christ have a fidelity and a repentance and a restoration that only God can give. This is how Christ saves you. Amen. Notice here with me, this is also a, a precursor to the restoration that is to come in Christ. Look in verse 20. It says, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall, what does it say? And you shall know the Lord. Circle the word know. That's a big deal to God. And it has to do with like a man knows a woman, has true intimacy with a woman. Here's the picture. God wants you to intimately know him and be intimately his and committed to him. Over and over again, we see that this is the heart of God, that you would know him. Psalm 3, verse 8 says, salvation belongs to our God. You see, this is where it comes from. Salvation belongs to God. He gives you salvation. Your blessing will be upon your people. Look at Psalm 62, verse 1. My soul waits in silence for God only. Look what it says. For him is my salvation. From him is my salvation. Our salvation only comes from God. And then we see not only in verses 17, 18, 19, 20, but also in 21 through 23, goes back to the poetry, and it's a powerful piece of poetry that says, see the glorious restoration of the Lord's blessing on his people. This is where you see that he is going to come and bring a blessing of renewal with him and right relationship with him and knowing him that is unimaginable. Look at verse 21. And in that day, I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The idea is I'm going to cause the heavens and the earth to produce. Look at verse 22. And the earth shall answer the grain and the wine and the oil and they shall answer Jezreel. The picture is he's bringing blessings. He is causing everything to work right. Verse 23. And I will sow her for myself in the land and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, 
You are my God. You see, God comes, and look at all of these, and they, and they, and they, and I, and I, and I. Over again, we see what is going to be the fruit of God's renewal of our relationship with him. There is blessing and blessing and blessing, blessings galore. You see, this is a good point for us to remember the grand narrative of God's grand plan. If you've been here in the life of the church, you've been hearing this. Four words, maybe five, that can sum up the whole Bible. And here they are, right here at the bottom of the page. God creates the world. There's creation. And then there is the fall. We fall into our sin, and this is where all of the pain comes from. But there is a redemption that is in Christ. God comes to reconcile the world to himself, and there is the redemption plan. That's what the Bible is all about, God's redeeming plan. And then there is the glorious promise of God that he is going to make it glorious, what it was at the beginning. He is going to restore all things. And so all that which the locusts have eaten, God is going to restore. All of that which Satan has stolen, God is going to restore. And this is the grand plan for all of eternity, that God will come and make his people his own. Would you stand with me for prayer?